This is going to be the first video in a series on cohort studies, and this one's just going to provide an overview of cohort studies. The other one is going to go into more detail on prospective versus retrospective, and the third one is going to talk about analysis of data from cohort studies. So cohort studies are an analytical observational study. It's uh, one, of, one of the most common ones, and there's two main types, prospective and retrospective. And I'm going to briefly touch on that in this video, but go into more detail in a, in a video of their own. So the basic idea is you assemble a group of outcome negative people. That means people that don't have the disease yet. Uh, you determine their exposure status at baseline and put them into an exposure positive and negative cohort. Uh, you follow them over time, either measuring disease periodically or at one time at the end. And you figure out if the rate of disease is different depending on whether you were in the exposure group or the non-exposure group. So uh, two important things about your starting cohort is that everyone is at risk. So that means two things. That means they don't have the disease right now and it's possible for them to get the disease. So uh, there's certain diseases that only affect people of certain age groups or biological sexes. So uh, you need to be eligible to get the disease and you need to not have it yet. Um, so as far as just what the sampling would look like, uh, I have a video on sampling where I kind of went through something like this where, well, I guess, first of all, you figure out who's disease positive and get rid of them because they're ineligible to be part of the study. Um, then you randomly select from the population. And this is more just like kind of a, an analogy of this circle where like obviously like these two people are more physically close to each other than everyone else. And in that way, they're clustered. But it's more just to represent a random selection of a subset from the population. So you select them, you figure out their exposure status. Uh, the most common design is exposure versus lack of exposure. Um, then you put them into their respective groups and follow both over time. Uh, the example here is five years. And you figure out uh, who became de disease positive. That's what these red people are and basically figure out if the, the rate of disease over this follow-up differed depending on whether you're exposure positive or exposure negative. Equal vigor is a concept that uh, basically applies here where you wanna make sure that when we're looking for disease, we're looking just as hard in the exposure negative and exposure positive group, uh, where let's just say there's more frequent visits with the exposure positive group or there's more uh, basically when they are visiting they're looking harder for the disease uh, that would lead to some information bias in the sense that you're you're more likely to have disease caught if you're in the exposure positive group than the exposure negative group and that would likely bias the results in a way that uh, it would make the let's just say exposures more likely to cause disease and you look for it harder in the exposure positive group you're probably going to find it disproportionately with them and underrepresented in this group so it would make the effect look stronger um, so yeah, a way to avoid that is not telling investigators which exposure group they're in uh, when they're collecting information. That would be one way of blinding to, to help with that. Um, we don't need to witness them go from exposure negative to exposure positive. Uh, those in the exposure positive group likely have been exposure positive for some time now. Um, but one thing we need to make sure is that when we're following them and, and, t and basically when they're accumulating time at risk, we need to make sure that everyone in the study is at risk. So uh, basically, um, this is just like a, an illustration of the like path of disease where you start with your first contact with the exposure. And uh, usually like an exposure like smoking, having one cigarette isn't going to pose a risk for lung cancer. But like if you continue smoking regularly, there's probably some threshold of like your like 10,000 cigarette where you've now had enough that it's possible for uh, lung cancer to be um, possible, like basically attributed to uh, smoking. Um, and that's exposure wise, um, where it's important to measure someone's disease, or sorry, their exposure status at the right time in this window, um, where let's just say they're really early in their etiologic uh, window here, where like they've only smoked 100 cigarettes, and we are treating cigarettes as like a yes or no thing. Um, then this person who's only held like a hundred would be classified as exposure positive, but it's not an etiologically relevant dose where we want to be able, we want to be measuring this dose at the time period when they've been sufficiently exposed, basically.
Um, and that brings me to my next point where once you've reached that like hundredth cigarette, that's, that's a sufficient exposure in terms of cigarettes, but in terms of time following that, there's usually some like oncogenic cascade that happens once you reach that threshold dose where it, like the next day after you reach that threshold is probably not, if you got lung cancer there, it would still take time. Like let's just say you got an intense bout of radiation exposure. You're probably not going to get cancer from it the next day. It's going to take some time. And in that way, this period of induction between when you have sufficient exposure and when the disease is expected to begin is the induction period. And disease status occurring here is irrelevant with respect to the exposure because um, if people from like the Chernobyl event got cancer the next day, um, it's unlikely that the Chernobyl event caused it because it takes longer. For, they likely had cancer already. Um, so at this point, the typical time after sufficient exposure that disease is expected to occur, that's when they're officially at risk and now accumulating time at risk. And any disease diagnosed after this time period is likely due to the exposure. Um, so some other common cohort designs. Uh, this previous example was by geography. Likely they were the, all those people were from the, the same town and they were subcategorized by exposure status. Well, I guess initially categorized by uh, getting rid of the disease positive people and then subcategorized by exposure. Um, some other common examples are comparing two separate exposures. Um, so it's not a matter of one group being exposure negative and one exposure positive. It's more just exposed to one thing or the other. Um, it could also be an, what we call an active comparator, where it's comparing uh, one drug to another drug. And again, this isn't the same as a uh, randomized controlled trial because these people aren't being assigned the drug by a researcher. They're um, being prescribed it in the real world, so it's technically, um, yeah, it's, it hasn't been randomly assigned. Uh, occupational cohorts are really common in uh, cohort studies where basically, like, we're taking like people who work in some injury in, in industry like uh, the plastics industry and like comparing within it so like comparing um, like those in management to factory workers who might be more exposed to some toxin um, and yeah it can also be exposure it, it's, it also can be like your exposure positive group can be people who work in the plastics industry exposure negative can be some like other like job of that socioeconomic class basically that that isn't expected to have that exposure um so that in that way you can have a comparator uh, but basically occupational cohorts are a classic um endeavor of cohort of cohort studies to basically figure out uh occupational hazards and stuff like that so uh your for your choice of your population um i, I find at least like in my master's and some of my first epidemiology courses like it, it seem I seem to overemphasize the representativeness of a population um, in your study. Basically, you want it to be as representative, but that's that's more of a descriptive goal for like when you're trying to establish the prevalence or incidence in a population. Um, but when your goal is understanding a relationship, it's common to seek out uh, regions where basically you're uh, more likely to find the exposure. So. Um, I have a video on sample size and power, and basically, like, if we go to populations where the disease is super rare or the exposure is super rare, um, it's going to take significantly more people to be able to find and detect an association, even if it's real. Um, and that's if, if we're picking a representative population, exposure and disease might be very rare and it might not be feasible, and in that sense, um, it's better to seek out regions sometimes where the exposure or disease is more common. and it, anticipate that although any measures of incidence won't be generalizable this like relationship between the exposure and outcome even though we're uh, seeing more exposure exposed and diseased people um, the relationship between exposure and disease is generalizable basically and this brings me to something called apportionment which is a way to uh, maximize efficiency and power when descriptive statistics aren't the goal um, so before, basically, uh, what we did is like we had this population. We didn't measure exposure at first, but if we had, it might look something like this. And then we're taking a subgroup, and you can see how much bigger the exposure negative group is compared to the exposure positive group. And that could represent a problem if, uh, like, on a larger scale, it's just so much bigger, the exposure negative group, compared to the exposure positive group. 
something we could have done is uh, figure out everyone's exposure status, separate them, and then uh, basically sample within that. And in that way, we get much more comparable group sizes, and that's called apportionment. Um, as far as the amount that you randomly select, uh, you can make it so they're exactly equal. And that's a way to maximize. Basically, you, you've sampled without regard for the outcome. Basically, you've, you've manipulated, like for a measure of effect, there needs to be like a disease measure and an exposure measure. And by, uh, basically our exposure measure is not going to be represented, like our d exposure distribution won't be representative of the population at large, but basically that's okay because uh, the way that we have made our population of interest different from the population at large is unrelated to disease, only related to the exposure, and so equally manipulated in both the exposure positive and negative group. Ideally, the distribution of disease should not be related to what we've done here, and in that way there should not be any issues um, with selection bias. Uh, so basically, uh, the prospective design, I have like it occurring over time here where it starts with a researcher coming up with an idea and a disease negative uh, cohort assembled, their exposure status measured, and uh, disease incidents being compared among the exposure groups. Um, so yeah, basically I, I, those slides before should have been gotten rid of, but uh, yeah, d basically they come up with an idea, uh, they take this disease negative cohort and find the exposure status and they compare whether the incidence of disease differed among exposure positive and exposure negative. With retrospective, um, basically it works with existing data in the past. So like hospital hospitals and insurance companies often collect information on an individual's um, disease status and exposure status. So basically we, we take records from a bunch of years ago and find some disease negative people and people who have their exposure status collected and then uh, these people often have like a, an elaborate file where uh, like their exposure and disease status might be periodically measured as they interact with the healthcare system. And in the more recent past, um, or the, basically the future relative to this measure, uh, we measure any changes in exposure and disease, also again collected by the hospital. And now this is temporarily after this is when like the, the researcher might not have even been born yet, or they might have been like middle school here. And by the time they're actually doing the study, when they come up with the idea for it, it's way after the fact and they're using records from the past, basically. Um, I'm gonna briefly talk about, like this prospective retrospective is gonna come up more. I'm gonna have a video dedicated to that. I'm just kind of glossing over here. And same here, closed and open populations are more of an analysis topic. And I'm going to do a video dedicated to analysis of cohort data, but basically a closed population is when everyone is followed for the same amount of time. So here the blunted end means the observation ended, the dot means the event occurred. So we have four people followed over four years, um, and some are uh, basically getting the disease earlier, but the way we would measure like the risk of disease, it's basically the number of um, events, so two over the number at risk initially. Uh, that the fact that disease occurred earlier doesn't change that event because like the time is not uh, It's not in that uh, design. You're basically figuring out a proportion um, As far as like the number of events over the number of people at risk um, So that's something called cumulative incidence and this is a closed population um, This person getting the disease and their follow-up stopping is not the same as uh, censoring which I'm gonna get to next it basically means they got the disease and they're no longer eligible to get to get it again, depending on the disease. So there's no point in still following them. Um, the other option is an open population. And here people are both um, entering the study late and leaving early. And there's lots of reasons that people might uh, be arriving late and leaving early. Basically, they could be dying of things other than disease. They could be moving away from the study population. Uh, yeah, they, there's all kinds of reasons, and uh, yeah, so with open populations, you need to account for everyone's individual time. Um, the time people spend in the study is less relevant here because everyone is spending the same amount of time, um, but as soon as people are contributing different amounts of time, we need to basically add up the amount of time that uh, people in the exposed and unexposed group are contributing.
Uh, also, when we analyze data like this, it gives the opportunity for exposure status to change. So you can see like uh, green here is unexposed and blue is exposed. This person went from being uh, unexposed to exposed. And when we calculate person time, so one person can contribute uh, time to both groups, basically. So just a brief overview of that. Uh, open populations let you have losses and additions. Closed populations don't. Um, with open populations, you got to account for individual time at risk. Well, with closed populations, everyone's contributing the same amount of time, so time doesn't uh, find its way into the formula, where you're calculating a true rate for open populations, a risk for closed ones. The basic formula here for open populations is the number of events over person years, or person time at risk. Both cumulative incidents, the number of events over the number at risk, so it's a proportion. And lastly, open populations can accommodate changing exposure status, while closed populations can't. Um, some other definitions are like an open dynamic cohort, being those that have additions and losses, and the ability to switch between exposure positive and negative. Well, the fixed cohort can have additions and losses, but you can't change exposure group. And a closed cohort being no additions or losses and no switching of exposure group. Um, so as far as uh, when to use a cohort design, some of its advantages, uh, these, this was going to be two separate slides, but they contribute very similar information, so I'm just, I just kind of consolidated them. Um, so when you're in, very interested in establishing temporality, and you have some concerns that uh, if you were to do like a cross-sectional study, um, that the uh, exposure might actually be coming second, or the exposure might even be causing disease, a cohort design has the advantage of helping you establish temporality because you witness people go from disease negative to positive. When the disease is common, uh, cohort design uh, does better because you're more likely to accumulate uh, basically disease positive people over a short period of time. Uh, similarly, um, diseases where there's a long time between exposure and the outcome, like smoking, might not be great for a cohort design. Uh, just because it'll take so much time to accumulate uh, disease positive people but when it's really short um, like the time between being exposed and getting a disease as a result of exposure the cohort design thrives there um, and when you anticipate little loss to follow up that's related to kind of having a short follow-up or a certain population that's more likely to uh, be willing to adhere to follow-up um, a cohort design is better, but if you expect, expect there to be uh, a lot of loss to follow up, then cohort might not be the best option. Um, when you're interested in multiple outcomes, the cohort design does that well, basically. Uh, you can basically just make sure they're disease negative for all these different outcomes at the start, and uh, you can measure all kinds of outcomes uh, over time, basically. Um, and when exposure status isn't, uh, isn't fixed, like when someone can go from being exposure positive to negative over, over time, a uh, cohort study is good for that. Uh, a retrospective cohort design uh, brings some unique benefits to, to some of these things, uh, and when I do that video comparing the two, that'll become more clear. Um, so some of the main drawbacks is it's often really expensive to follow a cohort for so long, especially if you're taking measurements on them periodically. Um, this potential for lost follow-up, again, if it's a really like, like a 10-year follow-up, you're going to lose a lot of people probably. Um, exposure status at baseline might not be etiologically relevant, like they might have just started smoking, uh, they might have, and, and they're, no, they're not at risk already, if that makes sense. I, I talked about that earlier a bit. Um, also, uh, they might have been a smoker for the longest time and recently stopped smoking. So there's often like a look back period that's part of the design where they at baseline are not only asking what their current exposure status is, but basically their recent exposure history for um, however amount of time is, is considered relevant. Um, so if they, yeah, that's basically what I said. Uh, you can't accurately provide true incidence measures. So that's like what I was saying about how it might not have uh, might not be good for descriptive goals, but it might be better for analytical goals where you're not trying to find the incidents, but you are looking for a measure of effect. 